There is no avoiding war. It can only be postponed to the advantage of others. Niccolo Machiavelli Hyrule knows war. It always has, and it likely always will. From the blood spilt in the battles against Demise, to the utter slaughter of the entirety of the Hylian armies by Calamity Ganon a thousand centuries later, Hyrule has never avoided it for long. Greek philosopher Plato once said that only the dead have seen the end of war, and nowhere is that truer than in the lands and kingdoms of Hyrule. In a way, this endless state of war is a natural byproduct of the reincarnation cycle. There will always be a Ganon to gather forces and light Hyrule ablaze to make room for a Link to rise and save them. The thing is, though, the wars across Hyrule aren't always against demonic armies. In fact, one of the deadliest wars in Hyrule's history was also its most mundane and regular. A long, drawn-out conflict that saw massive casualties and totally reshaped the societies in Hyrule. But this horrible war wasn't a battle against moblins and stalfos and demonic hordes. The future of Hyrule wasn't even at stake. And in this war, there were no good guys. Welcome to Hyrule History. Today, we talk about the Hyrulean Civil War. Before we get started, two quick things. First, I wanted to give my Discord a quick shout out. We have a great little community, so if you want to join a Legend of Zelda community at the ground level, or give me video ideas, find the link in the description and join us. Secondly, this is the first episode that is about an event as opposed to a person, race, or monster. So I'm taking this as a chance to experiment with the format. Please let me know what you think, for better or worse. Now, let's get into this. When attention is paid to the major conflicts in the Zelda universe, one might fleetingly think of the Ancient Battle or the War of the Bound Chest. However, there are three primary wars which are inscribed into the legends and that will sound familiar to anyone with a finger on the pulse of Legend of Zelda lore. The Imprisoning War, the Interloper War, and the Hyrulean Civil War. A lot of debate has happened over what occurred in these conflicts, when they happened in the timeline, and if they're all separate wars or just different names for the same conflict. The Interloper War and the Hyrulean Civil War in particular have been heavily theorized as being one and the same, with the Interlopers being major players in the Civil War. If these names don't sound familiar, worry not. I'll review the Interloper War and the Imprisoning War in brief before we analyze the Civil War at great length. It's important to do so because it seems obvious to me that the Civil War and Interloper War are not the same war whatsoever, and that the Civil War is a totally isolated event. First, a bit of academic housekeeping. I'm going to find a way to actually utilize the history classes I pay for, and I'm going to do that by applying the three tiers of historical sources to all my videos going forward primary sources, secondary sources, and tertiary sources. A primary source is a source written or created directly by the topic we are studying, so in this case it would be material directly from Nintendo, namely the games and manuals. Secondary sources are sources that directly comment on or deal with primary sources. In this case, secondary sources would be things collaborated with but not created by Nintendo, like the Hyrule Historia or Encyclopedia. Then tertiary sources. This one we're going to stray from the historical meaning a bit and instead consider tertiary sources to be those sources which are not collaborated on by Nintendo at all but have received their approval. This would be your strategy guides and Nintendo powers. A primary source is always considered more valuable than a secondary source, but multiple secondary sources contrasting a primary source can raise questions to the validity of the primary source. For a real-world example of this, see the Alexander Romance. I apologize for the setup, but this topic more than any other deserves proper analysis, and I would like to do it as properly as I can. Now for some review. The Imprisoning War, the Interloper War, and the Hyrulean Civil War. The Imprisoning War is retold in the introduction to A Link to the Past. It refers to a conflict which ensued when Ganondorf entered the Sacred Realm and took the Triforce. The Sacred Realm became the Dark World with Pig Ganon as its king, and from it he launched an invasion into Hyrule. Ganon's forces and the Knights of Hyrule did battle, with the Knights barely succeeding and ultimately imprisoning Ganon in the Dark World. 
The Interloper War is told midway through Twilight Princess by the spirit Laneru. At some point in time, most of the denizens of Hyrule became aware of the existence of the Triforce, the power it grants, and the location of the Sacred Realm. Many of them sought after it. One of the factions in this struggle was a dark tribe of sorcerers known as the Interlopers. They tried to use their sinister powers to claim the Sacred Realm, aided by the power of the Fused Shadow. However, the Light Spirits spoiled that plan, sealing the magic granted by the Fused Shadow away and splintering the Fused Shadow itself. The Interlopers were banished to the Twilight Realm and eventually became the Twilight, doomed to exist in the Twilight Realm for all of eternity. Keep those two handy as we spend considerable time examining the Civil War. We'll come back to them. The Hyrulean Civil War is told during Ocarina of Time, after Link completes the Forest Temple and returns to speak with the Deku Tree Sprout. Some time ago, before the King of Hyrule unified this country, there was a fierce war in our world. One day, to escape from the fires of the war, a Hylian mother and her baby boy entered this forbidden forest. The mother was gravely injured. Her only choice was to entrust the child to the Deku Tree, the guardian spirit of the forest. The Deku Tree could sense that this was a child of destiny, whose fate would affect the entire world, so he took him into the forest. After the mother passed away, the baby was raised as a Kokiri, and now, finally, the day of destiny has come. Primary sources do not give us a start date for the war, but we are offered an end date. Link's mother flees the conflict to deliver Link to the Great Deku Tree, and the war is over by the start of Link's adventure. So, the war ended sometime during the 9 or 10 years of his childhood. Essentially, Ocarina of Time plays out in the aftermath of the war, allowing us fairly accurate placement of the end. As for the start of the war, we get a fairly definitive answer from secondary sources. The Hyrule Historia tells us that the Civil War went on for countless eras. Now to be clear, this isn't referring to the labeled eras in the timeline. That would be impossible, as there's only a few of them before the war. And we know that there were a few stretches of peace amongst them. The term countless eras is likely in reference to kingships. It means that the war has been raging through the reign of many kings, and that they have been at war for as long as anybody can remember. This is not abnormal. A real world example can be found in the wars between the Byzantine Romans and the Sassanid Persians were in a consistent state of warfare for over 600 years. So it would be safe to say that the wars began shortly after the end of Four Swords, raged on for a few hundred years at least, and ended right before Ocarina of Time. With an understanding of when the war was, we can now ask, who was the war between? Who participated? Well, once again, primary sources give us very little information. Turning to secondary sources, things become a bit clearer. In Hyrule, we have quite a few factions. We have the Royal Family, the Sheikah, the Goron, the Zora, the Kukiri, and the Gerudo. The Kukiri likely didn't participate as they were relatively safe in the forest. Other smaller races like the Deku likely did take part, but we have absolutely no evidence leading to how they took part, so they won't be addressed. The secondary sources allow us to construct a rough framework of what happened, that of a war between the Hylians and the Gerudo. We know that the Hylians under the royal family took part because the war resulted in a unified Hyrule under the royal family. We know that the Gerudo took part opposite the Hylians for similar reasons. Ganondorf, who was the leader of the Gerudo at the end of the war, ended the war by submitting to the King of Hyrule. He did so on purpose to advance his political goals, certainly, but we do know that there was conflict between the Hylians and Gerudo because of the language used. The Gerudo Desert came to be governed by the Kingdom of Hyrule, implying it was independent before. Ganondorf was expected to swear fealty to the King of Hyrule. The language used implies that these actions are consequences for something, and a defeated king swearing fealty to another king is something with endless real-life examples. This is how vassalages are created. So we have a framework for our war. Gerudo on one side, Hylians on the other. What about the other races? Well, we have some evidence from secondary sources that every non-hidden race in Hyrule took part and suffered casualties. First, we have a line from the Hyrule Historia stating that conflict among the different races continued ceaselessly across the land. This implies that many different races fought, not just the Gerudo and Hylians. 
Secondly, we have a bit from the Hyrule Encyclopedia, which explains why we don't see much in the way of multiculturalism in Ocarina's Hyrule, in the same way we see it in, say, Breath of the Wild. The answer is because all the races lost a lot of people, and since the war is still over, the races are licking their wounds and recovering, likely economically and in terms of morale. As a result of this tension, the only real exchange is through diplomats. If one race hadn't took part, they would likely still be in a good enough position to have a presence all across Hyrule. These two bits taken together solidify the idea that this war truly included all the races. We now have an understanding of when the war took place and who took part in it, but who fought for who? Well, let's start with the Goron and Zora. The Zora is an easy call, they absolutely fought for the Hylians. Evidence of the deep ties between the Zora and the Hylians is everywhere in the primary source. From needing Zelda's lullaby to enter the waterfall, to the fact that they are on record as guarding the Water Temple in Lake Hylia on behalf of the king. And for the most exact proof, that awful owl specifically refers to the Zora as longtime allies of the royal family. So there's no doubt that the Zora fought on behalf of the royal family. What about the Goron? That's trickier. They certainly ended on good terms with the royal family, since they accepted subjugation seemingly willingly, and Darunia not only calls the king a sworn brother, but seems to have a kind opinion of him. And there is absolutely no way they fought with the Gerudo, as evidenced by the tampering Ganondorf did to Dodongo's cavern. The idea cannot be discounted, however, that the Goron were independent. Perhaps they did fight along the Knights of Hyrule, but I find it increasingly likely that they just holed up on Death Mountain and defended themselves from intruders, most frequently the Gerudo. Then, at the end of the war, the Goron had no issue agreeing to subjugation by the King of Hyrule, as Darunia, who would have been the leader at the end of the war, obviously respects strength, and would have seen the King of Hyrule as the strongest leader around after becoming the victor of a centuries-long war. It's hard to say for sure whether the Goron helped or stayed neutral. All we can say definitively is that they did participate, they had to deal with the Gerudo and Ganondorf's treachery at some point, and they ultimately agreed to subjugation. That brings us to the last race, and the most interesting involvement in the war, that of the Sheikah. Before we get into them though, now is the time to pull the imprisoning and interloper wars back out of your pocket, as we need to deal with them before we can go any further. It should be obvious at this point that the Imprisoning War has nothing to do with the Civil War, and the idea that they were linked always baffled me. But if you need some further proof, here it is. The Imprisoning War takes place in between Ocarina of Time's Defeat Branch and A Link to the Past. The stronger case has always been that the Interloper War and the Civil War are the same, or that the Interloper War was a small part of the Civil War at least. The argument is essentially that during, or perhaps because of the Civil War, the Sheikah had a schism. Some Sheikah fought on the side of the royal family, other Sheikah did not. These Sheikah who defected got power from the Fused Shadow, perhaps tied to Bongo Bongo. The Fused Shadow gave them access to powerful magic, and they were able to successfully fight back against the other Sheikah and the Hylian army. It's unknown if they were supposed to have sided with the Gerudo, or if they were their own third faction. Regardless, these traitors supposedly ended up wiping out the majority of the Sheikah, which is why they are seemingly all but extinct at the beginning of Ocarina of Time. At that point, the Spirits of Light intervene and banish them into the Twilight Realm. The banished Sheikah would go on to become the Twilight. This betrayal is, according to the theory, what led the Sheikah to include the Tear in their symbol, to represent the betrayal by their own people. That was the gist of the argument. If you want to spend some proper time exploring the arguments, I recommend the videos by McIntyre and Christian Sanchez on the topic. I also offer HMK's excellent rebuttal video, links found in the description. This in my eyes has always just been hopeful thinking. Secondary sources absolutely disprove it, take a peek at the timeline placement in the encyclopedia. In addition, we know that the number of Sheikah in existence directly correlates to how much they are needed. The dwindled Sheikah in Ocarina of Time are not because they were wiped out, but because they weren't needed. The only Sheikah needed was Impa to protect the princess and aid Link. But even putting aside secondary sources, logically the theory just doesn't make any sense. The Sheikah are highly as people, they would never work against the royal family, especially not in their prime. Notice that the only time we see evil Sheikah, the Yiga, is after the royal family betrays the Sheikah first. The teardrop thing doesn't really work either. If the Sheikah were largely wiped out due to the betrayal, and basically only Impa was left, 
I highly doubt she was running around the inside of the Shadow Temple, painting teardrops onto every Sheikah eye, and swimming to the depths of the well to engrave it onto the lens of truth. She has a princess to protect. Impa doesn't have that kind of time. We also know what the teardrop stands for now. It stands for the sorrow the Sheikah feel towards their role, as the people who will do literally anything, no matter how dark, in order to keep the royal family in power. So we can put the idea of renegade Sheikah to rest, and definitively say that the Interloper War does not take place during the Civil War. What purpose did the Sheikah serve in the Civil War then? Well, I already hinted towards it. The Sheikah did whatever they needed to. The Encyclopedia describes it with more elegance than I could. In eras of war, they are essential agents of the royal family, handling all manner of duties, from combat to intelligence gathering. No matter how dark or perilous the task, they will do what is necessary to keep the kingdom from harm. And trust me, they really lived up to the dark aspect of dark and perilous. But the atrocities committed by the Sheikah in the Shadow Temple is fuel for a separate video. So essentially, the Sheikah acted as everything from spies to commando units to frontline fighters to assassins to executioners and torturers. Really, the Sheikah were the KGB or Spetsnaz of the Royal Army. And with the position of all the races established, we can finally take a look at the battle map as a whole. On one side we have the Gerudo, on the other the Royal Army, and the Sheikah, and the Zora, and possibly the Goron. Wow, not very even. We now know how long the battle went on for, what occurred during it, how it ended, and who took part. But it needs to be asked, how did the Gerudo put up a fight against all their neighbors that lasted hundreds of years? And why did they go to war with the rest of Hyrule in the first place? How did the Gerudo, a single race of people, manage to keep pace with the rest of Hyrule with no allies? I'll answer this by exploring the factors in the order of impact I believe them to have had. To begin with, it's worth paying heed to just how inherently defensible Gerudo Valley is. The primary entrance is via an easily destroyable narrow bridge. Knock it down and a valley separates them from their opponents, allowing them to rain arrows down on any enemies attempting to cross with boards or hookshots. Then an opposing army is bottlenecked into Gerudo's fortress, which looks like it was purpose built to be as miserable to try and conquer as possible. Even then, the Gerudo could fall back to the Spirit Temple, likely knowing the enemy would not be able to make it through the Haunted Wasteland. And if an opposing army does make it through, well, they have to try and sack the Desert Colossus. It really does seem like the Gerudo built their homes with this type of impregnability in mind. This is likely because of the inherent militarism of the Gerudo as a people, which is my next point. They are a militant warrior people. They live in the harshest conditions imaginable. They make their living through thievery and pillaging. Every member of Gerudo society is seemingly carrying a weapon. When the Gerudo attack a Hylian city, they know that if they can get past the defenses, the rest is easy. This guy certainly doesn't look like he's going to be doing too much in defense of the town. The Gerudo are different though. If the Hylians were to push into their settlements, there are no fleeing townsfolk. Every Gerudo is armed and trained to fight. Defeating the Gerudo means defeating every Gerudo, not just their standing army. The Gerudo also came under the leadership of some very capable people, with Kotake and Kume ruling for 400 years, the bulk of the war, granting wise insight and powerful magic. Then Ganondorf, a powerful, ingenious tactician, takes control and immediately improves their position. What I believe to be the most important factor, however, is how they fought. Or more specifically, one of the units they sent into war. We know that the Gerudo cared about horses and archery. This implies the existence of Gerudo horse archers. It might be hard to quantify just how big of a deal this is. I've seen a Redditor refer to horse archers as the atomic bomb of antiquity, and I think this is accurate. Horse archers, especially Mongolian horse archers, fundamentally changed how wars were fought and allowed the Mongolians to conquer half the known world. The proper utilization of the horse archers is equally as dramatic as the adoption of firearms. So if the Gerudo did indeed train skilled horse archers, it's not a stretch to imagine that the Gerudo were able to completely dominate the majority of battles they went into. If the notion that horse archers completely changed ancient warfare is something new and maybe hard to believe, please find in the description some links to follow where you can learn more about the real world impact they had. Between being a warrior people, having access to horse archers, and being aided by Kotake and Kome, it's no surprise whatsoever that the Gerudo were able to hold their own for so long, only giving up when Ganondorf willingly decides to. With an understanding of when the battle occurred, who competed in it, and how they fought, 
the last thing to ask is why? Why are the Gerudo and the rest of Hyrule fighting? Why did the royal family want to subject all the other races? Understanding the desire of the Gerudo is fairly straightforward. Ganondorf tells us what he's after. At the end of Wind Waker, he gives an entire monologue about it. The Gerudo lived pretty miserable lives in the desert with very little room to grow and expand. They wanted the same life all the other races had. Unfortunately, Hyrule isn't infinite and most of the other space was taken up by other groups of people. As a result, if they wanted a piece of the Hyrulean pie, they had to fight for it. This meant declaring war on the rest of Hyrule. More interesting is the reasoning behind the royal family's desire to unify Hyrule. Even if we can sympathize with his reasoning, the Gerudo invasion was still malicious and Ganondorf is still evil. And it isn't unreasonable to think of the royal family and the Hylians as the good guys. But I question this. The royal family didn't fight for peace, they fought for imperialism. If they were fighting strictly for moral concern over the well-being of the denizens of Hyrule, they would have fought to a draw with the Gerudo and then seeked out a peaceful resolution, like a non-aggression treaty, instead of subjugating them. And even if you argue that the subjugation was to prevent any further invasions, similar to what happened to Germany and Japan at the end of World War II, that doesn't excuse their subjugation of the Zora and Goron as well. Why did they need to swear fealty? The answer is simple, imperialism. The royal family wished to control all of Hyrule. In the real world, we have a concept known as the divine right of kings, which is tied to the idea of absolutism, a style of rule which is best simplified as God above the king and the king above all else. It is entirely possible that the king of Hyrule had a similar sense of divine entitlement to rule. After all, the Hylians are Hylia's chosen people, and the Hylians were chosen to protect the Triforce and the entrance to the Sacred Realm. There is an argument to be made that in order to protect the Triforce and the Sacred Realm to a satisfactory level, they needed resources, and the resources come from territory and vassals. A royal family in a peace pact with the Goron, Zora, and Gerudo is a lot less profitable than a royal family who's being paid taxes by the Goron, Zora, and Gerudo. Whether you want to believe that they simply did it out of obligation to protect the Triforce, or whether like I do you believe they did it out of a sense of divine entitlement to the land, there is no doubt that the royal family choosing unification over alliances and peace pacts is making an imperialist statement. With everything laid out, we can make one final review of the Hylian Civil War, with the context of everything we've discussed so far. Sometime after the end of Four Swords, the various races of Hyrule began settling into their ancestral homes. The Gerudo began suffering, as the desert was harsh and unforgiving. Food was tough to locate and unable to be grown. Reliance on thievery became a must if there was any hope of survival. The other races of Hyrule, and the royal family in particular, didn't seem keen on helping the Gerudo out. This caused first resentment and then hatred towards the other races of Hyrule. Kotake and Komei came into power and the Gerudo began falling into their role as antagonists of Hyrule. Things reached a bursting point and conflict between the Gerudo and the royal family breaks out. The Goron isolated on Death Mountain may have chose to aid the royal family, or perhaps they chose to stay isolated and defensive. The Zora, who have long had deep ties with the royal family, aided them immediately. And so a war was fought for hundreds of years. After centuries of fighting, a young boy was born, one who would change the face of Hyrule as it was known. A dark-skinned, red-headed boy. In fact, the first Gerudo male born in a thousand years, Ganondorf. He grew up with the war as a backdrop and the suffering of his people on the forefront of his mind. With hatred for the Hylians in his heart, the curse of demise had little trouble forming him into a vessel of evil. Adulthood saw Ganondorf take command of the Gerudo, and under his rule the Gerudo had their most successful push as they incorporated guerrilla warfare tactics such as starving out the Goron and trying to lower the morale of the Zora by killing their deity. This push was only temporary, however, as the Hylian army was no slouch. The royal army took little in the way of prisoners, with most captives, especially those of importance, being assassinated by blades in the shadows or hauled off to dark places never to be seen again. Ganondorf, a tremendously cunning tactician, and no political slouch either, knew that even with their martial prowess, horse archers, and magic, the Gerudo would never be able to overtake the royal army and all their allies. A draw could likely be fought to, and a non-aggression treaty offered, but that would just leave the Gerudo no better than they started. The future was in deception. And so, negotiations with the royal family began. The king, however, made one thing clear. There would be no ceasefire. 
The only way this war was to end was in a unified Hyrule, not just including the Gerudo, but all races that make their home on the lands of the goddesses. This was exactly what Ganondorf was looking for. A vassalage would lead to a much closer working relationship with the king, allowing him the proximity he would need to the Temple of Time to enter the Sacred Realm when an opportunity struck. And strike opportunity would. However, that's another story, one that I think most of you probably know. And that brings us to the end of the Hyrulean Civil War. A long, bloody, morally grey conflict with casualties that would not be exceeded until centuries upon centuries in the future. And the most violent conflict in Hyrule's history would not even be focused on the Triforce. It was merely the suppression of the needs of an oppressed people, reaching its boiling point. As somebody who hopes to be a historian one day, I'm very familiar with the phrase, those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. And in many ways, it's very true. Do you think the saying would apply to Hyrule as well? If so, they would do well to pay attention. For this is history that no Hylian, Sora, Goron, or Gerudo should be keen to see repeat itself. Thanks for watching another episode of Hyrule History. If you liked this, please consider subscribing, and if you have any topics you'd like to see covered on Hyrule History, let me know on my Twitter or Discord. The Gerudo seem to be a reformed people, and the races of Hyrule seem to have learned how to work together and care for one another's welfare. But the Gerudo would be wise to keep the memory of the Hyrulean Civil War in their hearts. To learn one lesson that's as true in nation building as it is in nearly every other aspect of life. And that is, that it's dangerous to go alone. Thanks for watching.